Bibles this morning and let's turn to the book of Ruth. going to readily acknowledge, and maybe I shouldn't do this, that I think I'm biting off more than we can probably chew this morning um, in this sermon. I'm fearful that <clears throat> there's more here than we probably ought to try to deal with on one Sunday morning. Yet at the same time, I feel like I want to do it this way because at least the way the passage was speaking to me in my own heart as I was studying it, all of this material needs to go together. Uh, so I am going to attempt to do it that way. I trust the Lord will use it uh, in, in our lives that way. But it is a lot of material to be covered. So we're certainly not going to read all the verses uh, here at the beginning. We'll read them as we go through uh, the message this morning. Maybe before we begin, I'll just um, read uh, probably the most famous or most known section that will, will be a part of our text this morning. And that's Ruth's statement to Naomi, as Naomi asked her to go ahead and return and go back to her, her home and her family, just as Orpah, her sister-in-law, has done. And we find Ruth's great, I think we could call it a great statement of faith. Uh, but let me read it for us, beginning in verse 16 of Ruth chapter 1. It says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God, where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What would move Ruth to make this type of statement? What was going on in the lives of Naomi and Ruth and Orpah? We'll try to tie it back in. If you weren't with us a couple weeks ago, we'll try to tie it back in with a little bit of the material that we looked at as we introduced this book, things that set all of these actions in motion. And then I want to try to really examine it from what does this say about faith? And because that's where I want to head in this message, I have entitled the message this morning, Faith Not Seen in Israel. Faith Not Seen in Israel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this morning, I pray that you might help us in these moments that we have to devote to your word, that, Father, we would be able to uh, not only just understand the narrative, it's really not that difficult. We shouldn't have any problem following the story that's unfolded for us here in Scripture. There may be some interesting nuances that we can bring out as we discuss it by looking at the meanings of some of the words or some of the things that are being represented here that we may not be completely uh, obvious and just a cursory reading of the text. And, and in that sense, I pray that that will be helpful and, and challenging to us as well. But Father, my prayer ultimately is that through examining what's occurring here and seeing what you chose to record and leave for our help, that it might speak to our hearts where we are today. And I don't know what's going on in the hearts and the lives of each person who's represented here this morning, but you do. And you know what each one needs. And you know how they would relate to our text this morning and at least the approach to the text we're going to be taking. I pray that you might take it as only you can and use it in our hearts and lives as only you can. May your spirit take your word and may he sanctify our hearts through it. Build our faith. Give us a greater understanding of our own weaknesses and give us a greater awe and appreciation of who you are. And we'll thank you in advance for what you will do, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin our message this morning here in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, I want to take just a couple moments, and I want to go to the New Testament, and I want to read two uh, occurrences that happen in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And I want to bring those thoughts to us. Most, both of these accounts, I think, will be familiar to most, most of us. But I want us to look at them or think about them briefly because I want those thoughts to be in our mind as we come back to our text in Ruth in just a few moments. You're more than welcome to turn with me if you'd like to and follow along or I can read it for you. But the first one's going to be found in the book of Luke chapter 7. And as Jesus' ongoing earthly ministry continues, we find Luke recording this event. Chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, 
Now when he had ended all his sayings, that's obviously speaking of Jesus, in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. For I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth. I say to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Most of us are familiar with this encounter. We have this Roman centurion. He hears, obviously, that Jesus is going to be nearby. He has a servant that uh, he cares very much for who is sick and is nigh unto death. And because he obviously has heard of the miracles that Jesus has worked, because obviously he has at least a measure of faith that he believes that if Jesus was willing, he could do something for his servant. He sends elders of Israel. He's not an Israelite, but he sends elders of Israel to Jesus asking him, would you please come and heal my servant? And when Jesus hears the request, he agrees to do so and he begins heading toward the centurion's home. But as he gets close, and somehow the centurion is made aware that Jesus is actually coming, he sends some of his own friends out to meet Jesus along the way, and he tells Jesus, hey, you don't actually need to come to my house. You can just speak the words from where you are, and if it's your will, my servant will be made whole. We understand from the text because the centurion tells us the reason he didn't really think Jesus should come to his house is because he felt unworthy. He didn't feel worthy as a Gentile to have probably not only a Jew, but certainly a Jew of the magnitude of Jesus to come into his house. Yet, nonetheless, because of what he believed to be true concerning Jesus, he requests for this healing to be done. And when Jesus hears of this, and the man's response to what Jesus is about to do, his statement is, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. I want us to look at one other passage, and we'll look back at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Again, another familiar passage to us, one that we looked at not too awful long ago when we were actually studying through the Gospel of Matthew. But in Matthew, chapter 15, we have another encounter with Jesus. In verse 21, it begins. It says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he, he, speaking of Jesus, answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he, Jesus, answered and said, I am not sent unto the law, I am, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Here we have another Gentile, a Canaanite woman. She has a demon-possessed daughter. She hears of Jesus again, obviously believes that Jesus has the power to rid her daughter of this demon. And so she comes and seeks Jesus out. However, Jesus acts as if this woman doesn't even exist. (laughs) She's there begging him to come and do this, and he just ignores her. He won't even answer her her requests. She obviously won't take the rebuff from Jesus simply and walk away. So she keeps pestering his disciples, obviously trying to get them to force Jesus to do something for her. And they come to Jesus saying, what are we going to do with this woman? Would you please send her away? She's driving us crazy. 
But Jesus tells his disciples, I don't have anything to do with this woman. I'm not here for the Gentiles. I've been sent into this world to take care of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Obviously hearing this with her own ears, this woman comes to Jesus, falls down at his feet and begins worshiping him and begging Jesus to help her. But even with this, Jesus sternly replies to this woman, it is not me to take the children's bread. In other words, the bread that belongs to the Jews themselves. It's not me for me to take this Jewish bread and cast it to dogs. Oh my goodness. What, what a statement and what that must have sounded like in the ears of this woman. And you would think, I, just thinking of myself, if I was this woman, having done this, humbled myself as I have and received this response from Jesus, I probably would have got up and said some not-so-choice words to him and marched off in anger, feeling fully justified for the way I've just been treated. But instead, this woman says this to Jesus, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. In other words, yes, I am a dog, but even dogs get some of the scraps that are left over after the actual family has eaten. And Jesus says, oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it even unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that moment forward. On both of these occasions, Jesus commends the faith of these individuals. And on both of these occasions, the individuals that are being commended for their faith are Gentiles. In other words, those not part of the chosen nation of Israel. Theologically, these illustrations carry deep and meaningful ramifications for people like us who are probably almost exclusively Gentile in our background. And because of this, we should never underestimate the wonder of what's happening here where we see that God does have a willingness to minister even to Gentiles. But on a more personal level, I have to wonder if these illustrations do not remind us of something more human, something more personally instructive, something which perhaps many of us, especially those of us who are Christians and have been Christians for any length of time, might be prone to lose sight of, misunderstand, and fall into the same trap ourselves. Now, when we introduced this study of Ruth two weeks ago, I entitled my opening's message, it, it was the worst of times. I asked us to consider that although the title of our current book is Ruth, and while Ruth is undoubtedly one of the main and key critical characters within this book, that in my opinion, perhaps the book should have been entitled Naomi, because I think it's more telling the story of Naomi than it is of Ruth. And if this possibly is the case, then we have a woman, Naomi, who has suffered great tragedy. She had previously, along with her husband and two sons, left her homeland because of a famine, which must have been so harsh that they felt their only hope for survival was to flee to the, to the area of Moab where food could be found. But after they arrive in Moab, Elimelech, her husband, dies. Shortly after this, her two sons die. And while her two sons had married in that time frame Moabite women, she as of yet had not had any grandchildren brought into their households. And so at the time of her death, there was nobody who could provide any ongoing lineage or heritage for her. And while she does have two daughter-in-laws, the fact that they also are widows and that they're Moabite widows to boot makes them in many ways more of an encumbrance to Naomi in her present distress than a helpful solution. And although she has lived in Moab for 10 years, and certainly she must have survived, I think we will see when she actually leaves Moab within our text today that she apparently leaves with close to nothing more than the clothes that she's wearing upon her back. So I don't know that she had much in the area of money, finances, possessions, or any of these things that we tend to think are so important in our lives. I am not trying to imply that Naomi had not experienced any joys during the past 10 years that she was dwelling in Moab. She undoubtedly had known some joys. Her two sons had gotten married while they were there. I'm sure that was a joyous occasion for them. We all experience sporadic joys along the way of our life experiences. But at the present, she's a woman in great distress. She's a woman whose whole life is turned upside down. And I'm pretty confident if I was in Naomi's shoes, she's, be, she's beginning to wonder and ask herself, is life even worth living? I would also ask us this morning, though, to not forget something else as we continue our exploration of this historical narrative. Naomi isn't the only person here who's suffering tragedy. 
I will acknowledge that Naomi's tragedy is greater. After all, she's older. She did have more to lose. But there are two other women who are suffering tragedy as well. Naomi's two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, they've also suffered great tragedy. They also have lost their husbands. They also are childless. And like Naomi, they are now facing the prospect of living a life of widowhood at a time in history when women were not afforded much hope outside of the protection and the provision given them by either their fathers or their husbands. And while we cannot know what legal or even spiritual opportunities were afforded them in Moab, they were not operating under the protections and provisions that Yahweh's law had afforded under the nation of Israel. And while I'm sure Naomi felt alone in her tragedy, we always do. When something hits us, we feel like we're the only one that's hurting. She was not alone. She had two daughter-in-laws who were also dealing with tragedy in their lives. And I wanted to bring all that to our attention this morning as we begin, because this is the way I want to approach the remainder of chapter 1 of Ruth. As we consider this unfolding of the ongoing narrative, I would ask us to consider these three women that are before us and the three choices that they make. And it would appear to me that this is something that the author of Ruth also would ask us to do. She wants to bring to attention these three women and how they respond to these tragedies. And it also, I believe, provides an avenue through which God can use this record of these three women to challenge and instruct us in our own present life. We're just going to go through the text. I think I've got like nine or ten points breaking it down here. We'll move as speedily as we can. I'm not going to uh, belabor any of the points because, for time's sake. But let's just move forward. I'll begin with what I would call the journey home in verses 6 and 7. We read this of Ruth chapter 1. Then she arose, speaking of Naomi, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how, how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. We're not told how. But in some form or fashion, word reaches Naomi back in Moab and informs her that the famine finally has lifted in Bethlehem, Judah, and bread is now to be found there again. This is stated in our text as being the result of the fact that the Lord visited his people, giving them bread. Now, if you were with us two weeks ago, you know that I went out of my way in the message not to assign motives to the choices that Elimelech and Naomi made. I don't want to... Uh, you know, have any kind of motives assigned to them because the text itself did not assign any motives. But you can almost sense the irony that the author puts forth when he makes this statement. The Lord visited his people and he gave them bread. Now, I don't think that the author is seeking to imply that Naomi is not one of God's people. But I do think we can say this. Naomi is not presently in a place to receive God's gift of bread to his people because she's not in Israel, she's in Moab. Her presence in Moab might have been in response to the fact that God had allowed famine to come to Bethlehem, Judah, but her presence in Moab was depriving her now of the opportunity to experience the provision of God in Israel when he once again chooses to bring bread unto his people. I would just challenge us, even in that thought, to re remind ourselves when we consider taking matters into our own hands when faced with difficulties in our lives, if we make decisions solely based upon our human understanding and reasoning, we may make decisions which appear logical at the outset, and that may even bring us a modicum of temporal success, but they also may place us in a position where we are not able to experience the blessing and the provision of God when it comes. Upon hearing that there was once again bread to be had in Bethlehem, Naomi makes the decision that she is going to return home. And her daughter-in-laws begin the journey with her. Again, the simplicity of our narrative would lead us to believe that these three women basically have nothing but what they can wear and carry on their, in their hands. We read nothing in the narrative of servants. We hear nothing of luggage. We don't even hear the fact that they're a part of some greater caravan of returning Israelites. All we are informed of is that there are three widow women traveling down the dusty road toward Bethlehem. As this unfolds, we go on with what I'd call my second point, Naomi's counsel to her daughter-in-laws. And we read that in verses 8 and 9. It says, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband, 
Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Now, it would seem logical that Naomi planned to send her daughter-in-laws back all the while, but she apparently waited until they were down the road a distance before she implores them to go home. Many commentators say she, she wanted to wait to have this encounter out on the road. Maybe if she had brought this up before she left, there might be fear that they could have talked her into staying in Moab or whatever. Who knows? It's all supposition. But it would seem logical to believe she never intended for them to come with her. But they did all begin the journey together. When she gets to the point where she feels like it's time for them to return, she says, return to your mother's house. <laughs> Which, in biblical speaking seems kind of strange. This may just be a, a statement that is a result of a story about women in particular, and so these ladies are being encouraged to return to their mother's house. I suppose it is possible that both Ruth and Orpah's fathers were deceased, and so in that sense, maybe they had to be challenged to return to their mother's house. Some commentators tell us that the phrase mother's house describes the living quarters for women, and thus the place where these two widows would reside if they returned home. But probably we should see nothing more in this phrase than this a challenge for these two ladies to return to their original homes. She wishes, as she sends them away, God's kindness. It's the Hebrew word has said. We've spoken about it many times. It occurs often in the Old Testament scriptures. And she wishes God's kindness to be upon them as they head home. Has said is a Hebrew word which often speaks of God's covenant faithfulness to his people. Sometimes it's translated his mercy. Sometimes it's translated his loving kindness. Naomi is giving her daughter-in-laws a blessing, so to speak, when she asks them to leave. And she's asking that as they head home to their mother's house that they might find God's, her God's, has said, his loving kindness upon their return. But then she says this, I want you to receive this because you've actually shown, speaking of the two girls, they'd shown has said toward Naomi and toward the deaths of their husband. In other words, she says, I hope God will bless you with his loving kindness because you've been very loving kind to me and so and to her husbands or their husbands who are now dead Naomi expresses a desire that they each find another husband back in Moab that they would each be able to experience joy and blessing in the days ahead and after she gives them this challenge she kisses them goodbye and we are told that all three of them lift up their voices and they weep upon this instruction we see the desire or the request that the girls give in response back to Naomi in verse 10 it says and they said unto her surely we will return with thee unto thy people you know both Orpah and Ruth here express a desire to remain with Naomi rather than returning home <laughs> I don't know when I read the Bible I guess you're like me maybe you're not I don't know don't pretend to know I'm, I'm always curious it's like well, why why would they say that why would they say we'll go with you was their previous home life so poor <laughs> that neither wished to return? Was their love for Naomi so great that they could not bear to leave her? Did they believe in their hearts that the best hope they had for a future actually was lying in Israel rather than back in the land of Moab where they'd grown up and known all of their lives? Again, the narrative itself does not inform us, at least not yet, it could really be any of the three that were the reasons why they said this, or any combination of the three. But regardless, these two ladies say to Naomi, no, we don't want to go back to Moab. We don't want to go back to our families. We don't want to go back to our mother's house. We want to stay with you. Naomi rebuffs this request, though, in verses 11 through 13. Let's read on. It says, and Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. When they give this response, this request, let us stay with you. Naomi is quick to inform these ladies that there is absolutely nothing good, in her estimation, that could possibly happen if they chose to stay with her. First, she tells them this, I'm past childbearing age. There are no more sons in my womb. There is no possibility that I am ever going to give birth to another son that, you could, that could grow up and you could marry. Secondly, she says this, even if there were, Let's just hypothetically think about this. What if I could give birth to sons this very night? 
Are you going to wait, she asked the girls, until these men grow up into manhood that you might marry them? But thirdly, and most importantly, she wants them to understand something about their mother-in-law. Naomi is saying this about her. She is convinced, she says, the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. In other words, and we'll talk more about this later in the message, Naomi is convinced in her own heart and mind that everything that has happened unto her is the result of God's hand being against her. All of these things are happening, Naomi is convinced, because we can say it this way, God's punishing her. Therefore, she's asking these two girls, why would you want to come with me? <laughs> why would you want to follow me? God's punishing me. God's hand is against me. Why would you want to continue to spend time with me, a woman, under the curse of her own God? In the verse, first part of verse 14, we see Orpah listening and obeying. It says, and they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Orpah listens to reason. Orpah returns to her home. Again, our author is unwilling to pass judgment upon Orpah's decision. She has obeyed her mother-in-law's wishes. She has decided to do what seems humanly prudent. She has chosen to remain where she is in Moab and remain what she is, a Moabite. Ian DeGuid in his commentary makes this statement. With that simple, sensible choice, she marched off out of the pages of the Bible. She went back to her people, back to her gods. Yet, though she certainly didn't see it that way, there was nonetheless a cost to her logical choice. Who now remembers Orpah? She rejected the road to emptiness, but at the same time unknowingly turned aside from the one road that could have led her to a life of lasting significance and meaning. The world's wise choice to avoid emptiness leads in the end to a different kind of oblivion. Friends, the narrative casts no aspersions upon Orpah's choice. It simply regards her as insignificant of any future mention. I would just say this. Every decision we ever make has consequences. And Orpah's decision had consequences as well. Did it turn out good? Did it turn out bad? We'll never know. Because God didn't deem her life having any significance of recording in the word from this point forward. While Orpah turns and goes back, we now find Ruth's resolve. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, verse 14, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. The narrative reminds us and informs us that Ruth cleaves or clave unto Naomi. It's the same Hebrew word that is used to describe God's intention in marriage. He instructed Adam back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall, he shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That Hebrew word translated cleave or clave here literally means to be glued together. Ruth clave unto Naomi and would not under any circumstance be willing to leave her. She gives her great statement of resolve that many of us know so well. Whither you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Thy people, they're going to be my people. Thy God, he's going to be my God. Where you die, and really, when we think of Naomi's life, that may be something Ruth the soon would happen very soon. Where you die, I'm going to die. In other words, there was no thought that after Naomi dies, Ruth would head back to Moab. No, wherever she dies, that's where Ruth is going to die too. And Ruth probably had the potential of living of many, many years in the future. And she says, I'm going to be buried right there where you're buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. How can Ruth make such a statement how does she know how does she even know in her mind that she's going to be allowed to lodge in Bethlehem once she gets there she's not an Israelite citizen she's a Moabite how does she know that the Israelites will ever welcome her into their community how does she know that even if she is allowed to stay for Naomi's sake that she will be allowed to arraign and remain and be buried there after Naomi has long since passed off the scene 
And she even is so uh, entrenched in her decision that she invokes a curse upon herself if she fails to uphold her covenant promises. But she doesn't invoke the curse in the name of Chemosh, the Moabite gods. No, she actually invokes the name of Israel's God, Yahweh, upon herself. The Lord do so to me, if anything but death separate us. Folks, this is a testimony of faith. It is a declaration of Ruth's faith in Naomi's God. And we'll say more about that in a moment, but how different is Ruth's faith than Naomi's? How different is Ruth's concept concerning Yahweh and Naomi's concept concerning Yahweh? We see Naomi's silence in verse 18. It says, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. We're not informed whether Naomi agreed with Ruth's resolve or not, but wouldn't we expect to read some affirmation or testimony of gratitude on Naomi's part? Even maybe if she thought it was foolish, wouldn't the Bible record that there was some sort of a hug or a kiss that happens here? Wouldn't there be some testimony of their now continuing on their journey together? Wouldn't there be some uttering of a word of thankfulness or gratitude or maybe even amazement by Naomi of Ruth's complete devotion that she showed to her, but instead the author is silent. There is nothing said here whatsoever except this cold, matter-of-fact statement that Naomi spoke no more to Ruth. So for the next 50 or so miles on their journey, nothing was said by either of them. But why would this be Naomi's attitude? Perhaps these final verses give us a clue. Let's look at Bethlehem's welcome of the two, or maybe we could say the lack thereof. Let's look at verses 19 through 21. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, <clears throat> for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? <laughs> when they finally arrive in Bethlehem, <clears throat> excuse me, the city is inquisitive concerning Naomi's return. We, I think we said this in the introduction. Bethlehem was a very small city. Most, most believe it never reached more than like 500 in, in its population. It was a small city. So therefore, everyone would probably have known everyone else who lived in that city. And yet our text makes us wonder whether these people really recognize Naomi or not. Their question, is this Naomi, could possibly mean them saying, is this actually Naomi who has returned, someone we thought who had left and was gone for good? She's been away 10 years. We never expect her to return. So that may be the way they're saying, is this Naomi really the one who left? She's back? Or it could also mean that Naomi had aged so much that Naomi looked so different than the woman that left 10 years ago from Bethlehem, that nobody could recognize her anymore. That may be what they're saying. Is this really Naomi? <laughs> Regardless of the meaning of their question, it was Naomi who had returned, and Naomi is quick to set the matter straight. They're giving her some sort of a welcome. Naomi says this, don't call me Naomi. Remember when we introduced the letter, we said Naomi means pleasant or lovely. She says, do not call me pleasant. Do not call me lovely. Rather, call me Mara. The word Mara means bitterness. She says, for the Almighty, El Shaddai, hath dealt very bitterly with me. She says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? It's kind of interesting that Naomi uses the, word, the Hebrew word that's translated full here, and it's a, it's a word that related specifically to a woman's offspring. In other words, regardless of the famine, this is what apparently Naomi was saying to them. The fact that she had to leave during famine, Naomi didn't consider that to be anything bad at all, all right? She left, she says, I left full. Even though she maybe left because there was no food, she still considered herself full because she had a husband and she had two sons. Now she says, I'm returning empty. And while she's returning to a city now that has been blessed with bread because the Lord has provided bread for the city again, she says, I'm coming home empty because I don't have anything anymore. I've lost my husband, I've lost my sons, I've lost my life. You know, as a quick aside, though, when we think about this return, what about Ruth? 
Shouldn't the presence of Ruth be something that Naomi could point to as at least a glimmer of hope in the midst of her tragedy? Again, the way the author presents this letter to us, we would have to say no. At this point in her experience, Naomi doesn't look at Ruth as being a good thing. She doesn't even acknowledge Ruth's presence at all. She would, Ruth would appear to be seen by Naomi as part of her emptiness. In this very sen real sense for a Naomi, Ruth, though here, does not exist. And I would just point out for our consideration this morning as well, notice that the author leads us to believe that Ruth doesn't exist for even the people in Bethlehem either. No one is asking the question, at least it's not recorded in the scriptures, who is this woman who's come home with Naomi? No one apparently says anything to Ruth at all. It's as if Ruth is there, but she doesn't exist. You have to wonder if you put yourself in Ruth's shoes, what is she thinking about her decision? <laughs> I left Moab, I left my family, I left any hope I had behind to come with this woman to this city, to these people who worship this God, and I walk into the city and nobody acknowledges I exist. Naomi won't talk to me. I'm here, but she says she's still empty. None of the people that came to welcome Naomi even acknowledge I exist or will mention my name or say that I'm here and inquire, who am I? I wonder if she's having second thoughts. <laughs> I wonder if she's wondering in the back of her mind, what have I done? Was this really a good choice to make? And remember, it's the curse that she brought down upon herself if she returned. There's no return. She's stuck with what the decision she's made. But I'm beginning to wonder if she's having second thoughts. you ever get there? Do you make this, this pointed decision based upon what you are confident in your heart is right to do and then things don't start turning out the way you anticipated and you begin to wonder uh-oh maybe i misread it <laughs> maybe i didn't understand maybe that wasn't such a good choice after all you know what is interesting about these final verses is the way naomi speaks about god she basically says this god is to blame Naomi lays everything that has occurred in her life directly at the feet of God. She says, it's the Almighty. It's El Shaddai that has dealt bitterly with me. She says, it's the Lord, it's Yahweh, which has brought me home empty-handed. She says, it's the Lord, it's Yahweh who has testified against me. That testified is a legal term indicating that God has found her guilty and that God has pronounced judgment upon her. And she says it is, again, the almighty El Shaddai that has afflicted me. It is God that has brought this tragedy upon my life. Wow. Those are strong words, folks. You ever thought about what she's saying? But I think, I feel confident in the way the author presents it. This is exactly what Naomi believes. I guess we can at least say this. Naomi does not see her God, Israel's God, as some cosmic weakling incapable of doing anything to stop the evil that is present in our world. Naomi sees God as the ultimate sovereign over everything that's happening in her life. Therefore, right or wrong, Naomi has no qualms claiming that it is ultimately God who has brought all of these tragedies to bear in her life. And by the way, I would just point this out. The author feels no sense of urgency to seek to refute or rebuke Naomi's accusations. He simply lets them stand just as they are given. These are the true feelings of Naomi's heart. As we conclude what is our first chapter in the text we're looking at this morning in verse 22, we see hope, I think. It says, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Bitter Naomi and unacknowledged Ruth have now returned to Bethlehem, and we are told that they arrived just in time for the beginning of the barley harvest. If this is the first time we had ever read this little book of Ruth, we would not even give that last statement a moment of our time's consideration. But most of us already know that this concluding phrase is actually a reference to the fact that God is not yet finished with Naomi. Yes, it will be Ruth who dominates the next two chapters of our study, and rightfully so. But really, only as she fits within the greater narrative of God's dealings with Naomi. 
So here's the question we all are forced to ask as we're reading the book of Ruth. How will God deal with Naomi? Especially a woman who's just said what she said about God. Will he continue to deal bitterly with her? Will he continue to leave her bereft of anything which holds meaning? Will he continue to testify against her? Will he continue to afflict her? And since this is the book entitled Ruth, let's ask this question about Ruth. Will she remain unknown, unrecognized, an outcast? Will she ever be accepted? By Naomi or by the city? Will God acknowledge her commitment to Naomi? Will God honor her commitment to him? Most of us already know the outcome, but our sermon series is going to force us to have to wait to gain those answers. But I think this morning there's a more pertinent question that we can ask, and that is this. Why does Ruth have such strong faith and Naomi apparently lacks any faith. Why is Ruth, a Moabite outsider, willing to stake all of her hopes in Yahweh's, the Yahweh of Israel, while Naomi, an actual child of the covenant, believes that she has no future whatsoever? Have you ever asked yourself those questions? Have you ever asked the text those questions? I started this sermon by reminding us of two Gentiles who exhibited great faith in Jesus during his earthly ministry. And in both of those cases, the Bible informs us that they both understood they deserved nothing from God. Yet, by faith, they believed that God was just and good and merciful, and therefore they displayed unwavering faith in him. I kind of want to believe that Ruth is this same type of person. I think she's a young woman who knows she deserves nothing from God, but yet who believes that God is just, that he is good, and he is therefore willing to stake her destiny upon this goodness of God and trust him going forward. Naomi, on the other hand, the one I really think the book is about, she is one who knows God, has known him all of her life, she is one who has had God's covenant promises pledged to her, being an Israelite from birth, and yet she has seemingly lost all faith in God. And in fact, she is blaming God now for all of the troubles that are going on in her life. Do you remember Job's words to his wife after he had suffered all of this great tragedy and after his wife encouraged him to just curse God and die? Do you remember what he said? What, woman? woman I'm, I'm, impl- I'm bringing in. What to his wife? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not receive evil? And then the Bible goes on to say, in all these things, Job sinned not against God. What was Job reminding his wife? Have you forgotten all the good things God's done for us? And then he asked him this, asked her this. Should we then expect that God would never bring any evil into our lives? Here's a question for us to consider in light of our text this morning. Does God's character change based upon your circumstances? Does God's character change based upon your circumstances? Here's a question. Is God good one day and evil the next? Was God good when Naomi left Bethlehem full? And is now God evil as she returns to Bethlehem empty? What about Ruth? Was God an evil God when he caused Ruth to be born in heathen Moab in the place of people who worshipped false gods? But has he now become a good God's since he has allowed her to come to Bethlehem to serve her mother-in-law and to follow him? We know the answer, but we still struggle with it in the reality of our existence. God has not changed. He is always God. 
What changes is not God. What changes is our eyes of faith. That's what's prone to change. Perhaps, I can't say for sure, but the text would certainly lead me to believe, perhaps Naomi had come to believe that since she was one of God's children, she should only receive good things from his hand. And the fact that now God has brought tragedy into her life, she believes God is now bad. And perhaps it was this misperception concerning God which caused her to become angry and to become bitter at God when the things of her life did not turn out the way she anticipated. And perhaps Ruth, on the other hand, because as a Moabite, she had expected nothing good from God's hand ever. She had no expectation that God would ever do anything nice for her. And she believed herself not worthy of receiving any of the goodness from God's hand. Still, because of what she had learned perhaps from Elimelech and Naomi, maybe from her husband who was a Jew, maybe from what she had heard other Jews talk about, maybe from what she had disperceived, maybe because of what God and his grace was doing in her heart and things that were unseen, that are unspoken about here in the text, she was still willing to follow hard after God and to believe in God because she had come to believe that this God was a God of incredible grace. And therefore, in spite of the fact she's lost her husband, she has no hope for a future in herself, everything looks bleak and dark, and everything is turned against her, she still believes this. You know what? God has the power to save me, to keep me, to hold me, and I'm just going to cast myself upon him and trust that he will do right by me. Naomi, on the other hand, who has had no reason to doubt God's goodness whatsoever. You say, but pastor, what are you talking about? Of course she had reason to doubt his goodness. Her husband is dead. Her sons are dead. She has no heritage. She has no future. No, dear friend, she has no reason whatsoever to doubt the goodness of God because she has been a Jew all of her life. She could go and read the law. God had promised his covenant faithfulness to them. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> he said, everything that I have promised you will come to pass. I am your God. There is none other. There was absolutely no reason for Naomi to doubt God, and yet she has no faith right now. Circumstances have robbed her of her faith. The fact that some difficulty and tragedy has come into her life, she now assumes God's character has changed. He's not a good God anymore. He's a bad God. I wonder who God was on her wedding day when she came bounding down the aisle. If we can use our Western culture, I know it probably didn't work that way for them. But here she comes bounding down the aisle to her Elimelech who's waiting for her at the altar. There could be a greater day. I remember... She probably regrets ever having said it, but Teresa said this on the first day after we were married. This is the best day of my life. She's, she's wised up since then, but for the moment, it was the best day she'd ever lived. I kind of think Naomi felt the same way. What about the day that she bore Malon? And then the day that she bore Chilion? Do you not think as a good Jew... Naomi praised God and said, oh, God, you've given me life. You've given me sons. You've given me a future. And even though they were forced to go to Moab, do we doubt that on the wedding day when one of the sons married Orpah and one of the days when the son married Ruth, that that wasn't an exciting and happy day? That everybody went home that night rejoicing and thankful for the good hand of God upon them and his grace to them. Hey, even we could probably say it this way. We're in Moab. We've got food to eat. We're not starving. Our daughters are now, our sons are now married. There's a great future. There's a great hope. I have no doubt that there were many days in Naomi's life where she was so thankful she was a child of God. And she blessed him and praised him for his goodness. Well, then what has changed? What's changed? Well, her husband's dead now. Her sons are dead now. She has no earthly future in her mind now. Yeah, but all that's changed here is her circumstances, not God. 
Because what we know to be true concerning what God has revealed in his word, the God that's the unchanging God, then if God was good in the past, he's good today. Hey, have we gotten to the point, dear Christian? <laughs> have we gotten to the point where we think, oh, I'm a Christian now. I won't have any bad days anymore. I won't suffer any tragedies anymore. I won't have any loss anymore. No pain. I know there's a prosperity gospel out there, and there's a reason why it's so popular. Who doesn't want to think that every day from the future is going to be one upward rise of prosperity in my life? No wonder so many people get derailed when they wake up one morning and they go to the doctor and find out they have cancer. Or they receive the phone call like the dear young lady that was in the group here with us last week. Your husband's been killed in an auto accident. Now you're a widow with a small child. Where's God? What are you doing? And you don't even remember all those times you were praising God for his goodness in the past. The only thing that's consuming your mind right now is this. This isn't fair. This isn't right. This shouldn't be happening in my life, dear friend. The Canaanite woman who had the interaction with Jesus. The centurion man who had the, the, the servant that was sick. And Ruth herself as complete outsiders. Ones who had never known any of the blessings or the promises of God upon their life. Expected nothing from God. Began to observe that, you know what? People talk about this God, and as I begin to think about this God, and, and I look at the world around me that he's created and the things that he's over, overseeing and all the things he's doing, it's come to my attention. This God's not only all-powerful, this God is good. I don't know if he would ever do anything nice for me, but I know if I want to have any hope, he is my hope. <laughs> and so their faith is unhesitatingly and unwaveringly anchored to what they believe God to be, a good, just, merciful God. And even though maybe their entire past life has been one of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, they see God with hope and expectation and faith. Whereas Naomi, who has known basically nothing but the good hand of God, the moment tragedy strikes, her faith in God is eliminated. Not only do I don't even believe God's good, he is the one who's responsible for all this bad stuff. Don't you dare call me pleasant or lovely. You call me Mara because I'm bitter. I'm mad at God. He's done this and I don't deserve it. We've come to believe we don't deserve any bad things in our life, haven't we? Folks, can I clue you in on something? The fact that we live in a fallen world, we don't deserve any good things in our life. Any good thing that we experience is a testimony to the goodness and grace of our God. Folks, have you lost sight of the fact that what you deserve right now and what I deserve right now is to be burning in the eternal fires of hell? And the fact that I am not is all due to the goodness and the grace Faith not seen in Israel, Jesus said, concerning the two Gentiles that came to him in his earthly ministry. And I would dare say this. <laughs> faith not seen in Israel, when you compare Ruth and Naomi's faith, they're on opposite sides of the spectrum. The one who should be a testimony of faith has none, and the one who should have no faith is an anchor. <laughs> it's all how we look at God. I wonder how you look at God this morning. What kind of God have you anchored your faith to? Father, this morning I pray you challenge you with these thoughts. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning to be challenged and um, maybe rebuffed, maybe encouraged by the message that's found in this little book of Ruth this morning. Maybe we're in the midst of tragedy. Maybe we are bitter at you, dear God. Would you show us the incredible sinfulness of that spirit would you break us of it this morning would you bring us to repentance and sorrow before you for our sin and will we leave it at the cross and will we begin
begin to honor you as the good God that you are. Father, this morning I pray that you would do in our hearts what we have need of. Build our faith, even through the testimony of this little book of Ruth this morning, I pray. Help us to see that we can trust you through the good, through the bad. I ask all this in Jesus' name.